So this is going to be a very much a collaborative presentation, tag teaming here. I will just kick things off and then hand it over to Slesha, who's going to do hands-on demonstration of the project. And then we have a team of uh, people here uh, to help us with any issues. We have Jerika, who's going, to, who's going to be monitoring the chat. Uh, we have Jonas, who you know, is able to answer any questions related to APIs and integration. We have Sid, who can help with uh, any science-related questions. And then we have Abdahak, who can uh, answer any of the questions. All right, let's get it started. Uh, first of all, thank, thank you for joining. I know it's uh, pretty late in Asia, and some folks are from Asia here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about a project called VEDA, an open interoperable platform for open science. And you can probably tell I'm not Brian Freitag. Brian is uh, on a leave starting yesterday uh, because of his newborn. So I get to do instead of him. So bear with me here today. This is his slide. All right. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to give a little bit of background on Earth Science Informatics, the technical committee. That's what is organizing this uh, webinar today. I lead that technical committee, and uh, many of you are already involved in that. What this technical committee provides is a network uh, for people in geosciences and computational sciences to come together and discuss things of, uh, of interest and, and things that are probably going to be of interest in future. The goal is to exchange ideas and share knowledge like we're doing today, uh, advanced applications of informatics, assess technology to support uh, data stewardship and management. We have working groups towards uh, uh, for that particular reason. Um, there's one called uh, Remote Sensing data, Se data Systems Working Group. Uh, and ultimately what we wanna do is promote best practices and lessons learned from all of these projects. So out of that, today's focus is on infrastructure and platform development for geoscience community, uh, which is a strategic priority within GRSS. Uh, GRSS. And uh, we're going to particularly highlight this VEDA project, which is a NASA Earth Science Data System funded project. We have explored quite a few of tools and platforms over the last, uh, last year or so. And we are more and more settling on this, this uh, particular implementation for IEEE, one being is very collaboratively developed and open, and it has shown some success on, on uh, already existing large projects. So with that, if you're interested in uh, participating in the technical community, please, please go to their website and, and sign up. Okay, first thing first, if you choose to follow along hands-on uh, part of the workshop today, which Slice is going to lead, you will need a GitHub account, and obviously um, uh, some Python account, Python knowledge to follow along. But uh, once you have a GitHub account, if you don't happily sign up, um, you will need this link to follow along and get access to the computational resources. So I'm gonna leave this here for about a minute and then, uh, then move forward with the presentation. I think uh, Jerika is gonna put the link on the chat here, uh, if you can't type in fast enough. All right, I'm gonna pause for a minute now. If you just joined, uh, we're pausing here for a minute so that people can create an account and join uh, join the computational platform to follow along on the hands-on part. Thirty more seconds, then I'll move on to the, to the presentation.
All right, let's move on. So very briefly about what VEDA is. VEDA stands for Visualization, Exploration, and Data Analysis. This was created by NASA Earth Science Data Systems Program to address these three main reasons. Um, fundamentally, the way we do science is changing. It's more and more interdisciplinary science now, which relies on large amount of data, right? And, and, uh, and computational resources. That is also uh, what we have heard from the GRSS community, hence the, the strategy, strategic priority on that. And we also realize that working with this big data is not a trivial thing, right? In most cases, you need some computational knowledge and more specifically distributed comp computational knowledge, right? Which is very specific in computational science, computer science to me. So to address these challenges, uh, we, NASA went and created this uh, open platform. The idea here is to bring these large earth science data sets that are of uh, key key values to, into next to the open source tools for processing, analysis, and visualization, and also exploration, interactive exploration, which is becoming more and more mainstream now. The idea here is that uh, use focus on the open source tools and make them interoperable. So you have one streamlined system to do all of these. And the added uh, benefit here is that uh, once you have data and tools together, you can make it more accessible in a more customizable way. And that's what we're trying to show today. From, from NASA perspective, this is how it works in terms of data. Data could be anywhere as long as it's in the cloud. Um, in some cases, it's in high, high end computing platform as well that can also leverage the, the system. Uh, the idea is we do not want to duplicate this data, but have a central catalog that indexes this data data into, into one catalog. That's the ARCO catalog I've shown here. And once you have that, you have, you have this data services that comes out of the box. Right? This could include visualization services. This could include analysis services. This could include a geospatial information system, the GIS services as well. So this is backed by this something called EO API, which includes a set of these components. PG stack is for the database to uh, index the catalog. The T Tyler is for dynamic visualization. PPG is for vector data information. And the stack fast API is the API on top of the stack uh, specification. If you drill down a little bit more, this is what it looks like currently in the NASA system. Uh, you have these components talking to each other, backed by the PG stack. And then you have uh, uh, APIs for ingesting into the stack and and, uh, and moving the data to, to the central catalog. And once you have that, you have different ways of accessing this. From analysis platform, which you will see Slicer demo later, you can access this using standard APIs. Uh, scientists can also access it through uh, map-based interface, and then you have a dashboard interface that can be uh, geared towards public, uh, public consumption. Uh, the one key thing to note here is that everything is deployed in a cloud computing environment, and that's where we see uh, things moving forward, even uh, within the IEEE GRSS, uh, to support the IEEE GRSS needs. And this, this is what the EO API uh, is currently doing. Okay, um, if you look at um, beta, it has these four main components, right? And it supports the entire uh, geoscience research lifecycle, all the way from exploring the data, researching, and actually publishing new data products and communicating about your science, right? If you start from a novice user, one could go to a map exploration, right? You can go to the map, look at some layers, uh, drill down, into comparison or, or querying the data. Uh, that, that's what novice users will do. If a user is a little bit more advanced then they can go to the analysis hub where they can do take the same approach with the map but drill down on their particular area of interest or do it at much higher resolution or localize the information and so on. So you would need some sort of a, a programming knowledge to, to do that. And you can use that same interface to create new data product. And new data products can be published into the catalog, which uh, Slicer will show as well. 
And if you're ready to talk about your science research and you're not ready to publish in journals, you can actually use the data-driven storytelling approach to, to uh, make your information and results publicly available. So uh, the idea when Veda was formulated was to support um, these different types of users, right? For public, you have dashboard information that clearly uh, informs the public what is going on in, in using the visualization. If you are a student, you may able to use, be able to use the analysis hub and the data that's in the, in the catalog directly along with the dashboard. If you have a science team, you may need additional information uh, to search the data that's already there. You will heavily use the analysis hub. Uh, if you're a program manager and you want to create a new thematic dashboard for areas of your interest, you can take the components of it, right? You can create the dashboard and the search interface or a dashboard with search and data and catalog and analysis, a combination of those. And if you're a decision maker, end user, mostly you care about is the data and how you present that data to make the decisions. And GIS application is one of the key things for them. Okay, now talk about a little bit of where data has been used in, in production. This is uh, the US Greenhouse Gas Center, a platform for bringing in US uh, agencies, information and data related to Greenhouse Gas Center. This was released in, in at the COP last year. Uh, and this is using a full new deployment of beta, the components that I showed earlier. And you also have dashboard only deployment. This is the Earth Information Center or the Earth.gov, which is the implementation of virtual implementation of the physical Earth Information Center. What this is using is data that's already exists in the other catalogs, but it's pulling those in into creating a, a a uh, brand new uh, website or dashboard to support the earth.gov objectives. The place where we have also seen use just the service side of the things, this is the T Tyler usage from uh, the VEDA that VEDA provides into an operational system like fire information and resource management system that is run by uh, NASA. So this is particularly showing the harmonized Landsat Sentinel data sets which is being served through the T Tyler API and gets pulled in by this interface. So the, the, the takeaway here is that VEDA can be used as a whole or, or, or parts of it to support your need. And uh, there's also an interagency collaboration, collaborative product called Multimission Analysis and Algorithm Development Platform. This is a collaboration between ESA and NASA to jointly develop uh, biomass products. And they have used the data services, uh, the ingest, archive, search, the analysis hub component to actually collaboratively develop new data products and actually publish it within the system as well. So one thing we've also done, this is a very uh, prototype and early phase, is a, a full deployment of VEDA for IEEE GRSS. And it's it's uh, fairly bare right now because we, um, we want the community to put in the data and leverage the services. This is some sample, couple of sample data sets that uh, we're, we have published to show the, the uses of it. Okay, there are some things that are coming up in near future in terms of additional uh, capabilities. Uh, there is right now what, what is needed to support visualization and analysis within VEDA is the need for transforming the data into this cloud optimized geotiff. Right. So what we're seeing and what we're expecting in near future is the relaxing that uh, requirement into uh, scientific data formats like NetCDF, ZAR, or even Kirchhoff. And we've already prototyped some of these activities. We're just now waiting to scale these. Uh, one other thing that's coming in terms of feature enhancement is being able to do analysis and, and exploration on the same interface. Here you see a time series, uh, dynamic time series generation using this uh, feature where one can come and add layers and uh, draw a bounding, back, a bounding box and it, it does the time series analysis on the fly. And you can do this across multiple data sets if it's in the catalog. Another thing uh, we're seeing is more and more GIS capabilities being added to this. Uh, right now, you're able to 
index uh, or bring in the Stack API directly into open source GIS tools like QGIS. Uh, uh, however, the the mechanism to do that uh, is a multi-step process right now. We're trying to streamline that into a, a very simple process of bringing in data directly from the dashboard into QGIS type of interface. Another um, feature that we are actively looking into is the ArcGIS image survey integration. A lot of uh, agencies have already implemented their GIS capabilities using ArcGIS image server. And what we're trying to do is uh, directly integrate those data and information into VEDA so that one can utilize all the Bay VEDA features uh, out of the box. Okay, with that, I would like to transition to the uh, hands-on demo and, and uh, interactive session with Slesha. Slesha leads the uh, data services uh, group at the University of Alabama at Huntsville. And uh, she has been working to develop this script for demo for a while. So Stacia, you can take it away. Thank you, Manil. Hi guys. Um, yeah, uh, let's get started with the demo. Before that, let's make sure every one of us has access to the hub. So um, I'm gonna share my screen and point you to that URL again. So if anybody that joined late or has not been able to do that yet, uh, can go and fill out this form. Uh, but yeah, we'll wait for like one minute and then just get started. There's the link. Um, should open up a form which will ask for your name, affiliation, and GitHub username. Uh, your GitHub username is what we need to provide you access to the hub. So to submit that form if you want to follow along. And once you submit the form, you should receive an invitation in your email from GitHub and you need to accept that um, invitation before we can move forward. Not sure if people can uh, talk. If you have, uh, if you want to say something, you can raise your hand or put your questions in the chat. There is a technical issue. Some somebody says Laksha Nahar. The link has expired. This link, uh, it seems to be working. Uh, are you talking about this link here? You can come up mute. Yeah. It is working. <laughs> Somebody else said it, it is working. So um, let me see. It is um, if the link is not working, you can add your GitHub username in the chat and we can add you manually. Yeah, that'll work too. And, and make sure you go and uh, approve access in your email. Yeah, while we're doing that, let's go over what we're going to learn in this hands-on demo. So um, like Manil talked about earlier, VEDA uses a stack catalog for its data catalog. 
So we're going to learn how we can search and discover data sets from the stack catalog. And we're not just using one data catalog, we're using multiple stack catalogs to, to discover these collections. And we're going to use the same method that shows, and it shows how it's interoperable. That's how using a community standard software uh, assists in interoperability. So that's what we're going to show, number one. Uh, we're also going to learn how to extract time series uh, out of some of these data sets, um, given a daytime range as well as uh, an area of interest. Uh, look how the time series looks like um, using the T Tyler API, which is a part of EO API. And then we're also going to see how we can create a new data product and ingest it and finally see it in the Veda dashboard. And we'll be doing that with the IEEE GRSS instance of Veda. And we'll look at that at the end of the workshop. Uh, and also the content of the workshop is at this link. It's um, it's a public GitHub repo, so you can always come back to it and um, like work through the problems if we can if you cannot uh, complete the whole thing today at this hands-on. We'll also keep the hub access open for one week, Panda, so you can still go to the hub and run through the notebook at your own leisure. Um okay. Has everybody has access? Is anybody having problem with access or have anybody that hasn't gotten any invitation email? If not, I think we're ready to move on to the hands-on. So um, here's the link. So if you click on this link here, tinyurl.com slash CRSS. Okay, yes. Yeah. Uh, sure, okay. Yep, got it. Thanks, Erica. This link here, if you click on this link, it will open the hub for you and download the notebook into the hub. So you will, you, don't need to go to the actual GitHub repo at all. This will do that for you. But it's there for if you want to look at it later. So when you click on this link here, you said get to this page. This is the um, landing page for the IEEE GRSS Jupyter Hub environment. So uh, if you have access already, if you have um, accepted the invitation that you received in the email, you should be able to click login and get to this um, this page here. And we have multiple server options here. We're gonna choose the first one and uh, we're gonna use, click the resource allocation drop box and pick the biggest one, 7.4 GB RAM. Anybody having trouble uh, getting to this page. Please let us know in the chat. So basically the first server, the first server option, modified Pangeo notebook, and the third drop down option in the resource allocation menu. Um, for later, you can also play around with other servers that we have. We have we support R, we have a MATLAB environment as well as a QGIS environment. So to get to this option, you click this link here, right? And go there, you'll get to a login page. Uh, I'm already logged in. So you'll get to this page. And then you click login to continue. And then this page should appear. Okay, I see some messages that said they are not authorized. Uh, did you fill out the form 
and did you click on the acceptance link for the invitation that was received in your email? And also, uh, are we approving on the back end fast enough? It should be automated. Okay. Once you once you fill out the form, you will automatically add, be added to the users. It says four for not found. You are requesting pay that does not exist. Can somebody go look? Or just uh, the luck or Jerica, can you look at the team and see if they have been added in the team? Yes. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to repeat this again. So we have this link here tinyurl.com slash crssp.2024. It's also in the chat. You click on the link or go to that link. It will take you to this page here, the landing page for the Jupyter Hub, which has GRSS here, right? So now you click login to continue. And then choose the first option, which should already be selected. And click on the start drop down menu here and go to the third option. Let me zoom it in a little bit. 7.4 GB RAM. And then click start. Please let us know if we are still having issues or if it is solved, we can move on to the next part. Yes, these options can be changed later. Um, you will have to, so did you, did you choose something else? Is that the issue or is it just for general knowledge you're asking? Even if you chose any other uh, option here, it's, it's fine. As long as it's the first server, it's fine. Okay, cool. So that looks like... Did you fill out the form, Destiny? And did you click the invitation link that we will receive in an email? Can we not add ask people's GitHub here in the chat to be faster moving forward? Yeah, just add in your GitHub username in the chat. That'd be much faster now in the interest of time.
Terika or Abdullah, can you verify all these have been added so that we can move along? They've all been added. All of you should have an invitation in your email that's associated with GitHub that you either use to sign up or from your previous existing GitHub registration. Check that email from or for something from NASA Veda Workshops, and it should ask you to follow a link to accept. Um, and once you do that, you will be able to access the Jupyter Notebook um, that Slesa is now showing on the screen. So please go ahead into your email and accept that invitation um, from NASA Beta Workshops. Check spam if need to. And then um, you'll be able to go directly to the Jupyter Hub space that Slice is showing. Lisa, I suggest you continue. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, so the first server here, the third option, click that, and then press Start. Uh, now, this is going to take a little bit to load. But once it loads, it should go to a page where you can see the notebook. Well, there are two options. The first one is the notebook and second is the readme file. Just click on the first one. That's the notebook that we're going to be following along. So the first option, the IEEE GRSS webinar, March 2024 notebook. Click that and then you should get to this screen where it's loading the notebook for you. Okay. Can you increase your font size? Um, yeah, is that good? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, okay. Let me start by um, telling what we're going to do in this notebook. So we're going to go, we're going to work with two data sets. The first data set is the terrestrial water storage anomaly data set, and that will come from the VEDA catalog. So this TWS, or for terrestrial water storage, is uh, is defined as the sum of all water on the land surface and in the subsurface. So it includes uh, surface soil moisture, root zone soil moisture, groundwater, vegetation, like river, lake water, and things like that. And the anomaly is basically how it, how different it is from the normal level. So negative anomaly means it's lower than normal water stories and vice versa. And then there's the second data set that we're going to be using, which is the Sentinel-2 L2A data set, which is basically uh, optical imagery of high spatial resolution. And the, this data set is available to AWS Open Data Registry and via the Earth Search. Um, stack catalog by element 84. So we're going to be using those two data sets. Uh, and we are also going to be comparing these two data sets. So the first data set, water storage, basically so is the groundwater, um, groundwater storage. And the second, for the second one, what we're going to do is uh, look at the NDWI index. NDWI stands for, uh, and got uh normalized difference water index uh so this is a an index which basically shows the water water level or like basically from the optical imagery you can identify water through NDWI index basically uh -huh. So we're going to visualize the NDWI index using the two bands in Sentinel-2 data set, the green band and the near-infrared band, and compare this NDWI visualization with the TWS visualization and see how consistent they are. OK, so uh, 
And then at the end, what we're going to do is we're going to create a new data product, which is uh, which will be a simple water mask that we derive from this um, water index, the normalized difference water index. And then we're going to publish this new data product to the IEEE stack catalog and then visualize it in the IEEE uh, VEDA dashboard. OK, so the approach basically goes um, like it's listed here. We're going to fetch the stack items, the stack data items for the GWS anomaly data set from VEDA catalog. We're going to visualize it in a map. And then we're going to create a time series chart for it for, for a certain time, date time range and an area of interest. Uh, we're also going to compare the visualization for one of the items from 2017 versus 2021. And we're going to do the same process for the Sentinel-2 data set, but we're going to visualize the NDWI index. And then we're going to compare the visualization between the GWS and NDWI. Uh, and of course, we're going to create the new data set and publish it. Uh, OK, so let's go through each of these cells in the notebook. Uh, here, we're just installing some of the dependencies we need for the notebook. Uh, we have leaf map for, for our map visualization and view stack for uh, stack operations or creating a stack item, which we'll do later. Uh, uh, all the other dependencies should already be installed in the hub. Um, run that and then run this one. Here we're importing all the Python packages that we'll need. Uh, we have a normal operating system, OS for uh, file manipulation and things like that for JSON requests for making API requests, date time for date time utilities. Uh, we're using Auto3 for uploading the new data product that we create into uh, the S3 bucket. Uh, for using leaf map and polyum for map visualization, Dask for distributed computing. We're using Rio stack and PyStack client for stack operations. Uh, Raster.io, NumPy, Pandas, Rio XRA, all of these for um, dealing with our GeoDiff datasets, GeoDiff files, and Matplotlib for any kind of charts or the time series that we're going to be doing. Okay, so here we're just importing all the things that we need. So we run that. Okay, now let's get started with our data catalog. Also, uh, if you have any issues, just feel free to write in the chat. So in this cell here, we are basically just defining the API endpoints for the stack catalog. And these are the uh, endpoints for the VEDA stack catalog and the T-Tiler. So T-Tiler is our dynamic tiler, which basically helps us visualize these cloud-optimized geotiffs that we'll be working with. So basically define the two endpoints here, tech API URL and Azure API URL. And we'll also define the collection name. So this is the collection name for the uh, TWS anomaly data set that I was talking about. So this is how you identify it in the stack catalog. So let's define variables for those. And then we're going to be using the pystack.find um, method or like our uh, interface for opening the stack catalog, basically interacting with the stack catalog. It just has these wrapper methods that help us uh, easily interact with the stack catalog instead of making an API request and things like that. So here we're just opening the, um, connecting the client with the stack catalog. And then we're going to use the get collection method and give it the collection name that we defined here, LIS GWS anomaly, or and then run that. It will I'm printing the collection here. It will basically show what the stack collection looks like. So this is um, a stack collection. It follows a certain specification and basically the it it's a JSON format and has all these keys uh, 
type collection, the ID of the collection, the stack version, the description of the collection. And it has all these various links for itself or more items in that collection and things like that. But what we're more, most interested here is this item assets. And there's a cog default asset. And this is the asset that will contain the, the link to the data file corresponding to any item inside the collection. So it, it's in GOT format and it's cloud optimized. Uh, once we search for the items, we'll open up the item and look at look at the actual uh, link through. And there are basically other metadata like license, um, if it is a periodic data set, if it is uh, what time density it is and things like that, right? So that's our collection. Now let's now that we know the collection, we know what the collection looks like. We have the collection ID. Let's search for items for that collection within the start date and an end date. So we'll just provide um 2021. 2021 start date January 1st and end date December 1. Like right. So we're we're just gonna provide this. We're assigning it to these two variables and we're gonna use the search method and provide these uh, query parameters. Like the date time is uh, the start date to the end date. This is the format we send the values in, start date slash end date. We're gonna provide the collection that we want to search to. So that will be the, the it requires an ID list of IDs. So this is the ID that we got from the collection, right? So this is our collection and ID. So it needs this ID. So that's what we're passing here, collection.id. And once you run this function, it will it will search for search the catalog for all the items that matches this date time, this date time range and the collection. Uh, and then we're showing how many assets are in the are returned by the search. And then we're just going to play around with one of the items there. We'll pick the very first one item. This is a list. This comes as a list with all the items that belong to that search um, query. And then we're going to choose the very first item and play around with it. So if we run this, it will show you there were a total of uh, 335 items in that collection for these uh, date times. Right, so, and then we have assigned the first item, the very first item in the uh, return by the response to the item variable here. And now we're gonna try to visualize this data, so this item that we just um, got. Uh, so let's do this. So. Uh, let me show you what the item looks like. So I'm just adding a, a new line here, item. So it will print out what the item looks like for us. Uh, yeah, so, okay. So this is what the item looks like. Again, it is, it follows the stack specification for an item. The ID, it will give you the ID for that item, the bounding box for that item. And there are some links that, allow you to navigate within the stack catalog. And then earlier we talked about this cog default asset, right? So you can see that in the asset, in the cog default key, it provides you a link. Now this is the link for the data file that the item uh, is talking about or that the item indexes, right? So we're gonna, this is a cloud optimized GeoTIFF. And it's in this bucket, this prefix, we have the link here for the data file. Um, and let's look at other things. So there's this raster bands key, which basically uh, tells you about if there are multi bands in the data, the detail for all, each of the band, the data set, the um, metadata for each of the band, like what the data type is, the histogram, the statistics, um, mean, standard deviation, maximum, minimum, and things like that. Right? So we have only one band for this one, and it's basically this one, the 
data is provided here. Then let's look at some other things. So, so geometry also so basically what's the geometry the item covers or what collection it belongs to. Of course, it's going to be the LIS GWS normally because that's what we searched for. Uh, it gives you the date time for that data set uh, and other metadata, right? So there's all these metadata. Now we want to visualize this metadata, visualize this uh, this file here, the this item, right? So for that visualization, let's go back to our collection definition. So there's this one key here, renders. So this renders key so was, um, gives you all the parameters required for you to visualize the uh, the item or the file inside the collection in a, in a in a way that makes more sense, right? So what what asset you want to visualize, what color map, uh, what's the rescale parameter, and all those things like that is uh, is provided in the collection level metadata. So and that's what we need to visualize the this data set. So that's what we're we're getting here. So. We got the collection converted into a dictionary, and then we get the renders and dashboard value. And this is this is the metadata for visualization. If I run this, you can see it prints you this thing. Uh, it's basically saying use the first index first for use the first band index. Um, use the cog default uh, asset because that's the that's the asset that can be visualized. The assets can be many other things, like it can be, I don't know, uh, like a, me a different metadata file, or it could be a link to some a JPG file or something like that, right? So it tells you, use this one. This is the one that you need to visualize. It gives you other parameters like rescale, resampling, what color map to use, and things like that. So in the next cell, we're gonna use this value here to visualize this item that we looked at earlier. And this uh, this asset, basically this, this link to the file. Uh, so we're here. So in this cell, what we're doing is making a request to our um, Tyler, to our, we defined the endpoint for the T Tyler here. So this is our, Tyler, and we are using the stack slash tile JSON endpoint, which gives you by a tile JSON, which is a format that includes how that shows how to include a some tile into any mapping service, right? So we're passing it the collection, which uh, we've already defined TWS normally, so that's that it gets that from the item, and then it gives the item ID. Those are the query parameters it needs. Uh, plus, all of these are the parameters that it needs for visualization. So we pass all of these two. So passing the asset from here, the rescale value, um, color map, and things like that. Right. So let's run this, and it will give you back a JSON. It's called tile JSON. It will show you what scheme it's using. Uh, for for this one, it's X Y Z. It could be other things like WMTS, WMS, and things like that. For this one, we're using X Y Z, and this tiles key will have the link to the tiles. And there are other data, other data, right? Right, like the bounds. What are the bounds for this um, this uh, image that will come uh, from this these tiles, basically? and the center for this charge. So that's, and we can use this now directly in our map to visualize that data set. So in this next one, next cell, we're gonna be uh, creating an instance, a map instance. We're gonna be using the leaf map uh, Python library to visualize the map. Uh, we're defining the center as the center that was received from this style JSON. Uh, we're adding some other parameters that we'll need. And finally, uh, 
Sorry. So tiles, yeah. So in the tiles, we're passing tiles here. Uh, the tiles that we got back. Uh, actually, I don't think we need that. But yeah, that's fine. Because we're adding the tile later here. So we're just defining the map here, right? So we're defining the map with all the parameters that it requires to visualize what we want to visualize. Uh, we're also adding a geocoder control. So you can actually type in the location and zoom into that location. So this is what this one does. And finally, we add the tiles from this. So you can see the tiles are provided here. So tiles is this this value here, tiles. Inside here, we have this tiles uh, key. And we are using the first, basically, this link. We're passing that link to to the map and we're adding it as a tile layer or providing other attribution and name. And now if we run this, it will visualize that the, the cloud optimized UOTIF for that item that we looked at in a map. All right, so we have this map and this is what the TWS anomaly value for uh, that one item that we looked at looks like. Right, so let me stop here for a moment and see if everything is going well. If you have, if you're having any issue, please uh, put it in the chat and we can try to figure that out. So basically up to now, what we did is, let's go back so just for a uh, review. We defined the stack the stack and the dialer and points for Veda. We defined the collection name. We used uh, PyStack client to uh, talk to the stack catalog, get the collection with that collection name. We looked at the collection, what it looks like, all the important metadata that it has. Then we use the search function to search for, for items within that collection and within these start and ended. We looked at one of the items and we want we 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 visualize that one item into the map like so here. So these tools here you, uh, you can see uh, come from this parameter here that I pass like draw control is true. So that's where these draw control comes from. Um, so if you're getting no module named Boto3, what you can do is add Boto3 here. Boto3 and then run this again and then rerun it from the beginning. Um, I would suggest to keep on moving. Uh, I think we will keep this uh, notebooks available and access yeah. available and you can always communicate via email afterwards yeah okay let's move on don't have much time so let's do this now let's go to one of the location here uh, I want to look at like Powell in Utah uh, let's go there like let's look at the we're going to use it later. I'll come back to that. But uh, let's pick this location here. Uh, let's make a make a rectangle or square, whatever it is here. And we're going to be using this area of interest uh, to do later operations. We're going to look at the Sentinel-2 cog for this, Sentinel-2 files for this area. And also, we're going to create the time series chat for this area. So let's do that. So this method here, save draw feature, will basically save the the area that we've drawn here into 
um, we boxed a geojson and we're going to read that and now uh, that's what it looks like it's basically the area of interest um, in, in standard geojson format and we're going to be using this for our time series check that we're going to be making okay so time series analysis so uh, in this section what we're going to do is we're going to take this area of interest we're going to take the same date time range um january 1st 20 21 to December 1st, 2021, and create a time series uh, chart for this data set. So we've loaded the area of interest here. We create a utility method here that basically uh, calls the slash call slash statistics endpoint for T Tyler, which basically gives you the uh, statistics for that one call that you pass in the parameter here. Basically mean, min, max, mean, errors, um, and other things. And then it basically writes it into a dictionary and returns that. So this is a utility method. And here in this one, what we're doing is for all the item that the search gave back to us earlier, um, it will run this method for each of the item and pass the AOI parameter uh, that this will be using AI and item these two, right? So, and this is uh, using DAST, so it's it's a distributed computation. And finally, we gather all the results. So, if we run this, it's gonna it's gonna take a while because what it's doing is for all the items, it's taking the uh, the cloud optimized UOTF file path and passing it to this endpoint calls statistics endpoint getting back the result for each of those 335 or how many items and uh, basically creating this dictionary which contains all of that for each of the start date uh, okay while it's doing that we have this another utility function here, which basically takes in the response from uh, the API, basically this response here, and then converts it into a pandas data frame so we can easily use it to visualize and do any other operation. So this is a cleaning portion. So it, it normalizes the JSON, uh, does some header uh, replacement, uh, and then converts the date into a date time, returns the data frame, the pandas data frame. So we're gonna run this function for the results that we got from here. Let's look at the result for a little bit, see what it looks like. So it's basically a list, uh, list of dictionaries. Each dictionary is the metadata received back for one item or one cog. So if you look at this, it will give you the statistics for the first band, min, max, uh, histogram, and things like that. And it's basically repeated for uh, for all the items, right? So, and this will uh, clean that up for us. I will run that. And now we'll use this data frame, the pandas data frame, uh, to plot a time series. So we're just creating a plot using matplotlib. Uh, we're plotting the mean. Um, then we're gonna do this thing that you'll see right here, which will show you the standard deviation, like one standard plus and minus. Uh, we're also plotting the uh, minimum value and maximum value. Basically, some standard matplotlib plots. Right, so I run that, and you can see the plot looks like this. So this is the maximum average, minimum, and this gray portion. So it's the standard deviation. And this is this starts uh, January of 2021 and ends. Uh, so at the end here, uh, December of 2021, December 1st. So that's how you can easily use this API endpoint to generate a time series uh, for the items in the stack catalog. Okay, so there. Now, next, what we're gonna do is um, work with the data set from another catalog. So we've been using one catalog, beta catalog, 
up there. Now we're going to use this other catalog. This is the third search catalog by element 84, which contains all the uh, AWS open registry data set. So uh, you can see it looks like this, and we're going to be using this, this Sentinel-2 level 2 data set. Uh, whoops, here. So let's just define that stack. Basically what we did earlier, define the endpoint, define the collection. This is the collection ID. Open using find and then get the collection. Basically what we did, you can see how we use the same method, just replace the endpoint and the collection and it just works, right? So here we have the collection. Um, there's item assets like we talked about earlier, and this one has a lot of assets. This one, this is a. These are all bands within that data set. So this one is aerosol optical thickness. We have the blue band. We have the green band. The near infrared band, and uh, these two green and NIR band. These two are the bands we will be using to visualize the water index that we talked about. So this is standard collection stack that we talked about earlier. Okay, now let's now we want to compare the TWS uh, that we data set that we did all this for, and then we're gonna compare um, the NDWI index from derived from Sentinel two data and see how those look and if they are consistent. Right. So okay. Let's start by defining the uh, day trends. Um, in the first one, where we're looking at year 2017, and in the second one, we're looking at year 2021. We'll just pick one item from each of those and then compare that. Like two items each for uh, two collections and compare that. All right, so we did that. Okay, now in this one, uh, so this is using a lot of all the methods that we've been using before. So it's in one big cell basically doing the search for the first day trains for the TWS collection, uh, taking the first item. And this one, it's uh, doing the search for the second day trains and taking the first item and then making the tile request like we did before for both of these, the first item and the second item. Uh, same stuff, we've already done this. We know how that works. Uh, and then we are gonna put it side by side. So we're using this volume plugin dual map uh, and adding these tiles there. The first is from the first tile layer that we get back from the first request to detailer. And same for the second one. And we'll just add that to the map. If we run this, uh, if we go down, it should show you the two, um, Uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention some. Oh, sorry, I, I moved along fast. So this was the one I was working on. So, and if it, once it runs, it should give you a map here. Okay, so there's our map. Uh, the left one is for one of the items from year 2017. The right one is one of the items for year 2021. And let's go to the like power. Uh, area again. So, so you can see how different it is, right? So on the left, we have these uh, blue values, which are basically positive values. And on the right here, we have red values, which is the negative value. So in 2017, we have positive values and 2021, we have negative values. So what it means is in 2017, we had more than normal values, more than normal water uh, storage values, and in 2021 we have less than normal. Right uh, now we're going to compare this with the water index. So now we're going to do the same for Sentinel data. Um, basically the same thing. The we we choose the first state trains, which is 2017, get the first item, and we we'll use the second date range, which is 2021, get the first item. We're going to use this. Um, ttyler.xyz endpoint for uh, for the ttyler. Uh, and okay, now look, let's look at this parameter that we passed to the ttyler, right? 
So you can see there's an expression here, which basically uh, says green minus near infrared green divided by green plus NIR. So green and NIR, like we saw earlier, are the acids that um, that are the item acids, right? So we have all these different bands, and that's how they are defined, green NIR. So that's what we are referring to when we pass this expression down here. Uh, and we're calling it acid as band. So all these, these bands are uh, indexed as acids in an item, right? So we're passing acid as band flag, which is true. And then it will basically know where to look. You look at the green acid in this item, get the URL to the computation, right? So it's doing that expression and we're passing the weirdest color map and rescaling the value minus one to one. Uh, right, so this is the parameter we are sending. This is an extra parameter that we're sending because this is a multi-band and we, we are doing this band expression thing. But other than that, all the other um, requests are basically the same. Uh, we're making the request to dtyler, passing the parameter, the URL, which is the item uh, item ID for the first item, item ID for the second, the link for the item for that second one. Uh, basically creating the dual map um, and having these two tile layers, which will get the tiles from the first and the second um, item. And we're going to add it to the map. So run it. When you run it, you'll see uh, there's this map, and uh, you remember that we we chose the area of. Uh, we're also passing the area of interest here. Uh, yeah, here. So when we're making the search, we're also telling it, "Give me just the items within this area of interest." The area of interest is the one that we drew earlier in the map. So this intersects will only give you the uh, items that actually intersect in that area of interest. So we can see we can see the here, but it's also so it's basically the Lake Powell area. So we'll go in there, and you can basically see the water here. And now let's 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 just go here. So you can see here. Uh, that this this area here has more water, right? The, this um, yellow portion here that denotes water. So you can see in this area, there's like um, more water. So like this one does not have these branches coming out. This one does. This is bigger, right? And we're looking at the exact same location up here. So there was more water, less water more water, less water. So basically those two data sets correlate with each other. They are consistent. So yeah, from Brian, I uh, have a quote from Brian here. So water storage is groundwater uh, and NDWI is surface water. So this would be somewhat consistent and that's what we see here. Smaller amount of water when the, uh, with NDWI when there's a negative water storage anomaly. So that we, that's what we look Okay, so that's the end of the next part. Now, for this next part, um, what we're going to be doing is creating a new data product. It's a water mask based on basically this NDWI index. Um, we're basically creating this NDWI index using the files from those two items. Um, and then we're use, you're going to use a threshold, um, which is 0 0.2. And anything like above that threshold is uh, water, and others are not. So basically, that's the formula we're going to be using. Let's, let's do that here. So OK. So we know the, we know the formula for NDWI, green minus NIR divided by plus NIR, right? So that, that's the formula we're going to be using. We're going to, for that one item that we, the first item that we looked at, we're going to 
get the cloud optimize your days for these two bands, the green band and the NR band. We're just defining the asset name here. Um, and you can see how I'm uh, referring to the href, which is, which is the link to the file. So these two are the S3 links to the file for green band and the NIR band. So this, I'm just going to free up some memory here uh, because we're going to be doing this big operation here, which which basically will read the two cloud optimized UOTIF, one for the green band, one for the um, NIR band. And it's going to apply this formula, green minus NIR, green plus NIR. So it's basically reading the URL, the file, putting it in green data. Same thing here. We're applying the formula, putting it in result, and we're thresholding it just a small value, 0 0.2. And for anything greater than 0 0.2, the value will be one, which is the water mask. And for anything less, it will be zero. So that way it will create a water mask for us, which will basically be a Boolean value. One for what? One for water, zero for no, what? One for land, zero for no water, water. Or some things in there. We'll see. So uh, yeah, so we do the computation here for we apply the threshold. Um, we just uh, get the date time for that item. This is the first item is the one that we're looking for. Just uh, to put it in uh, in the name for the file. So and the file will be called watermask underscore the date of the file dot tiff. And it this uh, this will write it to this file name as cog and some other parameters, right? So reading the two file, applying the formula, applying the threshold, writing to a file name this. So I'll run this. This is going to take some time because uh, those are a little, those are big files, high resolution files. So uh, so. So yeah, so this is gonna take some time, right? But it will create this water mask underscore uh, the date of that item, Tiff, and it will put it in our um, file system. Okay, so we have created this this new file, new new data product. Now we want to publish it. We're gonna put it in the catalog, and then visualize it in the dashboard. And this next portion um, is uh, so publication is is uh, behind authorization. So I'm just gonna run through it and show it to you. Um, you won't be able to do it because it needs authorized access. And you'll see when I give, when I put in the password down there, but this is just for like knowledge. How, how do you how do you ingest a data set to the beta catalog? And then finally, how you visualize it in the dashboard. So here I'm just defining the bucket name uh for the grss beta data store that's where we put all the files and i have the collection id here i'm just going to call it water mask from sentinel to uh run it and this this will basically upload the file this is a utility function for uploading the file to that bucket it will put it in the bucket under collection id folder and just the file name there run it run this, which will basically upload the file and give you back the URL for that file. And down here, we're creating the stack collection. This is the same uh, collection specification that we saw earlier when we're retrieving the data. Now we're creating this since we're pushing it to the catalog. Basically the same thing, ID, uh, type collection. This is the collection type. Uh, links, it will auto fill for uh, all the stack navigation, but if we wanted to put other links, we could add it there. Some title, uh, the spatial extent, we're basically using the bbox for the uh, the file that we use to create the new file, same for the date, other metadata, right? So we created the stack collection here. Uh, now in this portion is where I get the authorization to publish. So I put my username here, um, this is the publication URL for IEEE GRSS uh, beta instance. And we're going to get the token using the username and password. And uh, 
create this error. So this is just authorization stuff. Stuff don't need to worry too much about it. So I'm gonna run it. It's gonna ask for my password here. I'm gonna provide it here. Oh, pending. Oh, sorry. Uh, I put the input there, and it's gonna run this and give me back. Uh, the header, the the token. It will basically give me back this header token, which I can pass into the API request. So. Publishing the collection is pretty simple. Get the publication URL and add the slash collection endpoint. Um, it's a post request. We're gonna use to making to the collection URL. Headers is where it has the authorization token to, do, to actually do the operation. And this one is the collection that we made earlier up here. So we're gonna run this success. It says successfully published water mask from Sentinel-2. So this is our catalog URL for uh, GRSS catalog. So what we'll do is basically copy this and see if it exists there. So yeah, so it created this collection for us in the catalog. So basically the stack collection, right? That we looked at earlier collection. Um, the extent, all those things, right? So we have a collection. Now we need to put the file inside that collection as an item. So, which is pretty, this is pretty simple too. So basically uh, get the ID, which is basically the name of the file. Um, and then we have this, this stack uh, interface from Rio stack that we imported earlier and create stack item is a method that it provides where you basically pass these parameters like ID source is the, the path of the file, the collection ID, the input date time, um, and all those other things like extensions and things like that. And it will automatically create you a, create a stack item for you. So if I do this and Look at the stack item. It basically is the same format that we have seen earlier. So that it created an item for us. So to publish this item to the cat to the collection, this already has the collection in there to the catalog. We basically use this same publication API slash ingestion is the endpoint, and we're going to make the same kind of request. The URL headers is for authorization, and this item. I convert it to a dictionary and pass it in the JSON parameter. And if we run it, it says success. Now if we go back to this, uh, this is the collection that we uh, did earlier, uh, published earlier. So if we go to the link and go to items, it should show you this. This is the this is the file we uploaded, right? So the, it has this one item with all these uh, assets, all these. Uh, asset metadata and things like that. So here we, we have published a collection and an item within that collection, right? Now the next portion is uh, how much time do we have left? We're just about out of time. Oof, okay. So, <laughs> so the next part is basically visualizing the catalog. Uh, luckily for, luckily I've already done it for the, not this one, for the IEEE dashboard. So if I go look at the dashboard here, uh, I've already uh, added the configuration for this new collection. Uh, okay, and if I go to the data catalog, I've added this water mass catalog. And if I open that, Oh, it's taking an awfully long time. Okay, so explore the data. And that's the file we created. And it's loading there for us. Okay, here. So, okay, it was the other way around. So this is the zeros values are water and uh, the other portion is the mask. Okay, so this is what we this is a this is the product we created and published, and now it's uh, very easily visualizable in the uh, dashboard, and it it exists in this 
link which is in the notebook too. All right, that's that's about it. Uh, unless any questions, uh, I think we are ready to accept questions here. Uh, but yeah, otherwise the hands-on section is completed. Well, thank you, Salisha. That was a very comprehensive uh, walkthrough of the system. Um, does anybody have any question? Either you can come off mute or type a question on the chat. I think a few people have to leave at the top of the hour, so which is understandable. Any questions? Where was everybody able to follow along? Okay, thumbs up. Looks like we have a hand raised. Do we? Um, I don't see it. Oh, I see it. Yeah, Ben, maybe you can come up. As moderators, it. we have to manually unmute them. So if you go um, to Ben and ask to unmute, he'll be able to access his microphone. All right, Ben, you should be able to unmute yourself if you'd like to ask your question. Hello. Hello. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, actually, I'm Palakuna sir from India and uh, my only question, I, I just posted one question and of course I received the answer. Can I expect this uh, SAR data sets or tools related to this in this repository in future? And uh, how can I differentiate with respect to normal satellite data set? So I think uh, there are a couple of things. Uh, the GRSS version of the VEDA deployment, right? Uh, at some point that will be made open for, for users to use, community to use. At that mm -hmm. point, you can follow along what uh, Slisha did, right? Right now, you have to convert uh, your data into cloud-optimized uh, GOT format. If you're able to do that, mm -hmm. you should be able to publish that into that catalog of that uh, Slisha code using the same process. And then once it's there, all the other services are available for you to to search and discover, to for other people to use it, bring it to analysis hub, uh, visualizing the map interface, and so on. Yeah. Yeah, okay. And uh, if in future, if I want to contact any person, uh, can I get some mail or something? Yeah, I think, uh, um, is everything in the GitHub? Maybe we can make that GitHub open. Yeah, okay, sir. And share the link as part of the... Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I just wanted to say that uh, that link uh, is still saying for not for uh, just maybe after the we think it will be activated something, I think. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't hear the last part, but. I mean, like that uh, site, which is notebook, which we operated yeah. right now, uh, because maybe I'm from India or something. Uh -huh. It's not opening for me, and so. Oh, so, okay. It should be open, but yeah, if you have issues, uh, you can contact uh, Slisha. You should have, uh, we can, can we put uh, the emails here? Gerka of uh, Slisha and yourself, maybe? Sure. That is a good question, Mohammed. Uh, in terms of uh, validation is being carried out. So the idea is that uh, you go through that process of validation within the system, right? You develop a new product, you publish it, and you share it, share the link with the uh, with a community to verify before make it really public public. Uh, this is a this allows you to share with uh, with your uh, internal community before you want to make it public. I think one of the things uh, that slash I didn't get to demo is creating uh, creating something called data stories, data insights, and that's when you will really make it public for uh, for others to see. Hope that helps. All right.
Any other questions or comments? Well, if there are no comments, uh, thank you for joining today. I know it's uh, pretty late in India, especially in the Asia is pretty late. Uh, we'll probably do a series of this in the future as well as more features get added and more capabilities are added and and uh, we'll probably see you back again. Yeah, thank you. And a special thanks to Slesha and the team for for organizing this and, and monitoring and and providing technical help. All right. Thank you all.